So our next talk is Fabian Hayden, who's going to talk about dynamics and DT embedding. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, so what the title refers to is I'm going to try to connect two subjects. Uh, and we're going to start out on the first part of the title, the dynamics. So somehow in a, with objects which are probably very far from what you may do in uh, your field, uh, but we're going to try to make our way back to algebraic geometry and enumerative invariants. Um, so what I want to start out with in this dynamics is a particular kind of dynamical system. These are called interval change transformations. Yeah, and what are those? So if you yeah, there will be some measure preserving self maps uh, of the interval. We call it T, compact interval. How can you make a measure preserving map on the interval? Well, take that interval, cut it up into some segments, and then you rearrange those segments. So. Interval and I choose some generic lengths and choose some permutation. Maybe this became so, maybe lambda one. Let's rearrange to here. Um, lambda two goes here, lambda three goes here of the map T. Um, and I mean, if you want to choose these lambda generic, if they're rational numbers or something, then this will be a, a finite order map. But um, there's a, a result that if uh, these lambda i are generic, and uh, well, you don't want kind of if I, if I, if you fix some I want a permutation which basically rearranges the thing, so it should be some permutation uh, sigma. Uh, so that a subset one k is not mapped to itself. <coughs> k is between one and n. Uh, then, so this is a Result that kind of started this subject um, by Mazur Beach that uh, this T is ergodic. It means it's kind of uh, atomic in the sense of dynamical systems. Right? You cannot find a non trivial uh, measurable subset, which is preserved by T. Um, so, how, yeah, how do these guys deal with these interval exchange transformations? Well, you can turn them into geometry. So there's a, I'm claiming there's a hidden Riemann surface in this picture. Uh, in particular, so in fact, a Riemann surface which comes with a differential. Explain it in the maybe simplest case. So, say our sigma is just transposition of one, two, <coughs> two intervals, and so this is one way of cutting up, and then permuting them, we get the other way of cutting up that interval. How do you get a Riemann surface? You need to add one more dimension. So. 
you choose some height, and then <coughs> some piecewise linear function, and then you, well, you glue. So this this polygon corresponds to lambda two. So lambda two is over here. So these these two get glued. These two get glued. Sorry. In this case, get a genus one <coughs> Neumann surface. Uh, but it comes with an additional structure of these differentials. So, uh, if I, so if I think of this as a picture inside the complex plane. And I can use, well, here I have a coordinate uh, z, and that's going to give me a local coordinate on this Riemann surface I constructed. And because I glued things only using translations, this will be well defined up to translation. So c gives, this is the Riemann surface uh, x here, in this example g of x, the genus is of g1. So it gives a local coordinate. X up to translation. C goes to C plus constant. Uh, in other words, the differential is going to be well defined. One point. <clears throat> Polymorphic well, one form. In general, like any interval exchange transformation is going to give me a pair of this Riemann surface which you get from gluing the edges of the polygon together with uh, here's some one form alpha this dz in the original coordinates here's this Riemann surface <coughs> alpha is a holomorphic one form Pick this interval exchange transformation, but some that's more complicated. Then uh, you're going to get a higher genus Riemann surface, and then a holomorphic one form is going to have to have zeros. Are you still gluing by translations even in the higher genus case? Yes. Yeah, we're struggling to see how you get zeros. Yeah, so that because this doesn't look like it has any zeros, wow. right? Uh, the thing is, so you start gluing. And you get some, at these corners, basically, you're going to get the zeros. Because if you look at the total angle around that corner, you'll see that it adds up to some multiple of 2 pi, mm -hmm. and not 2 pi itself. And so, for example, if you get angle 4 pi, it tells you you add a zero of the Gerbach differential. So are you actually on an orbital on the yeah. Riemann surface? So z is not the cooler. It's like some power of z. z uh, yeah, so away from the zeros. <laughs> Away from zero. Can you say again where these symbols came from in that, in that picture? Uh, well, in this case, so, so this gets identified, these all get identified in this case. So the total angle here will be just 2 pi, but in some other situation, if I have a more complicated, right, like when you, when you glue the genus two, sur two surface, for example, from the octagon. Uh, and then you look at the total angle inside the octagon, you get 6 pi. So that's going to give you a double uh, quadratic differential with a double zero. Um, so, yeah, so if it's important, so if genus. X. Then alpha will have zeros. Yeah, so somehow now you've translated the problem that was originally in dynamical systems, in ergodic theory, 
need to kind of Riemann surfaces complex analysis and kind of why. Yeah, so some of the great contributions to the subject came from Mirsakani, <laughs> coincidentally. Um, but we're going to try to connect it to algebraic geometry. Um, and in particular, <clears throat> yeah, so before we do that, yeah, let me maybe also mention how to go the other way. So, I mean, how, how have I translated? So here there was this dynamical system, the self-map of the interval. How do I find that again in this Riemann surface? Well, this um, alpha in general, if I have a one form, gives me some foliation, oriented foliation. <coughs> Uh, which is vectors where, uh, let's say, DZ has, uh, alpha has maybe imaginary part of alpha is zero, some convention. Uh, and so that foliation, I mean, I want to take real part so that it fits with the picture. <coughs> In this picture, then the foliation is by vertical lines. And if I start out somewhere on this interval, follow the vertical line, and see where do I touch the interval again, mm -hmm. I get exactly my original map. So in general, if you want to kind of go the other way, uh, you have one of these Riemann surfaces with holomorphic one form. You pick some straight line segment on that surface, and then you so this because it, I'm calling those alpha. So this gives me a foliation. So if I start somewhere on this interval, it should be transverse to the foliation, and I follow some leaf. Of the foliation, and I see where do I return to the interval. So generically, what happens is that if I look at some leaf, it will <coughs> wind around densely on the surface. So it's kind of guaranteed to generically at least intersect that red line infinitely many times. And I look at the first time it intersects it again. And I do that for all points, then I'm going to get some self map of that small interval. So it's, I can also go the other way back from the Riemann surface with one form to interval exchange transformations. So, yes. Where are you using the form here? Uh, so this is a leaf of the foliation uh, that's defined using the one form. Yeah, so the foliation will have some similarities at the zeros, but uh, yeah, so everything here. So it's kind of generic. Generically, I return to the same red interval infinitely many times. Yeah, also I can here. Um, so instead of one forms, I can look at quadratic differentials. So alpha was a holomorphic one form or abelian differential. And if I take it square, I get something that's called a quadratic differential. But there's, um, well, there's usually Lots of quadratic differentials, which are not globally the square of a one form, just locally. Um, so why that's a bit better somehow is because if I look at the moduli space of Riemann surface with quadratic differential, this is like a cotangent bundle to the usual moduli space of Riemann surfaces. Whereas one forms will kind of sit inside there in some more complicated way. A technically easier case actually turns out to be generic quadratic differential. Um, okay, so you can somehow this, this about interval exchange transformation was motivation for considering these this kind of geometry, but uh, you can forget it from now on. Uh, so what what kind of problem? Uh, can, can one think about for these guys? So here I have a 
because I know I have a quadratic differential, it means I have a, a local coordinate which I get by integrating the square root of phi. And it involves now choice of square root and integration constant, so it's defined up to z going to plus minus z plus some constant. In particular, it means I can still talk about what's a straight line of a given slope on this Riemann surface x. So it just means that uh, I have got homonomy plus minus one. So makes sense to define. lines on this Riemann surface with quadratic differentials. What the square root of phi, so phi was a quadratic differential <coughs> integrating over a curve on the Riemann surface, or what do you mean? The primitive, so the take the square root, it's a one form, oh, okay. just take its primitive. So it's a curve integral, uh, sorry, a line integral that phi wanted to. Uh, okay, so the problem, so there, I mean, there are many problems about this, this kind of geometry and dynamics, but the one that sort of we can make some contribution to using DT invariance uh, would be the following. So uh, you can look at uh, what are called saddle connections. Uh, which is a straight line between zeros of this quadratic differential. So I assume I'm kind of higher, I have some zeros, I'm in higher genus. Um, which are called saddle connections, and well, they have some uh, homology class. First homology relative, so technically this is first homology of the Riemann surface relative to the zeros <coughs> of phi, and of slightly twisted coefficients, I'm going to twist by the square roots of phi. Um, <coughs> each of them defines some class in here, and I want to count, they call this gamma, some abelian find a rank abelian group, and we want to count the number of these saddle connections in given class. So I mean, typically it will be infinitely many, but if you fix the class in here, there will be only finitely many. <coughs> a given class gamma in gamma. And this is, so if you talk to people in this field, this is actually a quite ambitious goal. So usually what they do is they, uh, like they want to know the asymptotics. If you <clears throat> look at all these lines below some given length, how, how does the number grow asymptotically or something as you increase the length? So that's a typical kind of question that uh, people answer in the subject. This is actually quite a lot of data because here, so this is some kind of lattice and for each point in this lattice, I have some count, so there's like a lot of data that, in principle, I I'm, uh, I'm want to keep track of here. But it will turn out to be kind of the kind of thing that you have in DT theory, where for each class in, in some numerical k-group, you count semi-stable objects. Okay, so I think I should do an example at this point. <coughs> Yeah, and we're going to take phi to be uh, not holomorphic, but meromorphic, or holomorphic on C. So take a cubic polynomial times dz squared. P is cubic uh, with simple zeros. Uh, 
I have like a pool of order seven at infinity or something. So it's not, this example is not interesting from this dynamics point of view, because if I follow one of these straight lines, it will just generically, I'll just end up at infinity at the pole. Uh, but however, it will illustrate this problem of counting data connections. Um, so what does this, what does this local coordinate, what does this integral look like? Um, so, I mean, we want, to, we want to understand what are the straight lines. Uh, to do that, we need this uh, coordinate. So, the picture is something like, here are three zeros. And, um, it's important, let's make them red. Uh, and, this is inside C, and I have a map down integrating square root of p. Um, and to make it one-to-one, -one, I need to remove some, some regions which look roughly like this. Or here, the angle should be 120 degrees. So the complement, if I remove these three regions, the complement <coughs> maps one to one. Or, yeah, maybe over here. Here's integral square root of p dz. Well, there's actually turns out to be two cases. So one of them. looks uh, roughly like this. The point being that, um, yeah, so what's happened kind of, right? So these, sort of these, these two lines here at the boundary of the region, they have now, they're mapped to the same line over here <coughs> by, this, by this integral. Uh, so in this case, I see kind of a triangle. I see three straight lines or, or standard connections using this terminology connecting the, the zeros. Um, so that is kind of one case. However, generically, there's another possibility. And you can see that what can start to happen is that one of these red points, this triangle degenerates. One of the red points can cross uh, one of these sand connections. And then I will only have two of them. So now the pictures. this. You can ask, well, why is there no straight line over here, right? So if I start shooting a straight line, I go into this branch cut, and I end up trapped in this one of these yellow regions in that surface. Okay. The point is here, I have three saddle connections. And here I have two. And three is not equal to two. Uh, so the number of sand connections seems to change. Um, however, there is actually a way in which you can make three equal to two. Using quantum dialog algorithm. And then there's a clever way of somehow counting these things that even though it seems to change, somehow it actually then stays the same. Uh, and that's what uh, the wall crossing formula gets you. So, so sorry, just to understand, this is a, a local picture in, inside my Riemann surface, and this is, we're changing, we're fixing the Riemann surface, but phi is changing to go from that picture to that picture, or, or is the Riemann surface changing as well? Yeah. This is C, this is C, and this is the map integral of P. There's no Riemann surface? There's well, no I, 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 so I want to know what are straight lines on this surface. And because my differential is not dz, but it's something times dz, it means the straight lines kind of in here will not be straight lines in the same coordinate. So I need to find this special local coordinate. And to find that, I compute this integral. And now a straight line in this picture corresponds to a straight line in the sense in the preferred local coordinate. So this is just a coordinate chart for the preferred local coordinate. 
And it's a chart of everything outside these yellow regions. So he's writing from So here my phi is kind of something, right? And here in, the, in these new charts, I don't know this coordinate, let's call it W. Here phi becomes dW squared. And now if my if phi is dW squared, then that means I'm in my preferred local coordinate, so the straight lines are just the usual straight lines. Could you say something about the, the how you go from picture one to picture two? You 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 move the red one of the corners until it lay on the opposite line or something? <coughs> uh, so yeah, maybe I should say what I mean here is so it, I'm, I'm varying p what I'm doing. Sure. Yeah. So there there's some there's some set of degree three polynomials with simple zeros. And I'm claiming there's kind of two chambers inside this. Mm -hmm. uh, and one chamber looks like this, mm -hmm. and the other looks like this. No, just saying, can you, can you show us how, you, how it looks as you cross the wall? Would it help if you drew the two picture upside down? Because I think you're, you're kind of pushing the top, uh, one, okay, yeah. top one down until it hits the, the triangle flattens, and then. Sure, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right, so as I move in this set, this point can, well, there's some special case, non-generic one, just on the wall, where it will look like. This. <coughs> and as, as I go further, as I cross the wall, happening as I move this P. So if I take P, I don't know, C, CQ plus one, then you're going to be in this chamber and if you start varying the coefficients at some point, you have to end up here. All right, so quantum dilogarithm. And there's kind of uh, there's several ways how to normalize it. <coughs> Use the one that's in the considered Solomon paper, something like this, and it's a it's a power, formal power series with q numbers as coefficients. Uh, it looks like minus one to the n q and a half, and then here you have one minus q. 1 minus q squared, 1 minus q to the n, x to the n. Okay, so I don't know if, yeah, I'm not the kind of mathematician who sees one of those things and is immediately happy. And um, maybe some of you are not as well. So maybe some things which make it a little bit demystified, maybe a little bit. So why is it called the quantum dilogarithm? So first of all, if you take Maybe it's a little bit of a misnomer. You take the limit as the square root of q goes to minus 1 of 1 minus q logarithm of this e of x. You get the classical dilogarithm x to the n over n squared. So it's like the series for the logarithm, but you 
put n squared instead of n. Okay, so this, this explains the name, but it's still not something that <laughs> makes me entirely happy. Uh, but the thing has a kind of enumerative interpretation. It's counting something. And what is it counting? Well, uh, heuristically, it's counting finite di dimensional vector spaces. It's a number. Uh, does that mean? Well, we can rewrite this E of X. I mean, how you can see that if you replace all this 1 minus Q, you sort of put a factor of Q, you get Q to the N minus Q to the, yeah, you also turn around, right? you get, get rid of the minus 1 to the N, and you turn around all of the expressions in these parentheses, and then you get something like Q to the N minus Q to the N minus 1, Q to the n minus, uh, right, Q to the n minus Q, Q to the n minus so on, and so let's get the number of points in GLN. So it's the same as the sum. Yeah, there's a little bit of a annoying factor Q to the n squared half, which makes everything better somehow. And here you have the Serre polynomial of GLN. This is if you look at GLN over some finite field at Q. This will be just the number of points in GLN. And the general, I mean, the, the most uh, sophisticated way of thinking about it really is that you want to look at the motive of GLN. So this will be then a power series in some motivic ring. But uh, yeah, we work with Q numbers, take the Serre polynomial. And so why is this counting vector spaces? Right? So for each, I mean, there's only one vector space in each dimension, but the stack of vector spaces, you have some automorphism group, which is GLN. So the correct way to count vector spaces, you should divide somehow by the size of GLN, right? Just going on here. And, uh, well, we can sort of, this would, we could have to put this as a formal power series um, where n is the dimension of the vector space. Okay, so what does this have to do with uh, this picture over here? Um, how can we make 3 equal to 2? Yeah, uh, because um, so to get the number of points, I had to multiply the numerator and denominator by q to the n, n times n minus 1, half, something like that. Yeah, I, to get q to the n minus 1 times q to the n minus q, and so on, in the denominator. Um, okay, so this uh, satisfies a uh, identity, maybe five-term identity. So if you have some variables which Q commute, um, then you have the following identity, so E of X, E of Y, is E of Y, E of square root of Q, Y, X, E of X. And this is, uh, well, this is a special case of something <coughs> more general of the Kinsevich Solomon ball crossing formula. So you should think of somehow that these, these two factors, e, e of x, e of y, correspond to these two saddle connections, and uh, 
these three factors over here correspond to these three side connections. And what's, what has changed from the left to the right is some of the order of x and y. So when I, if you look at these two vectors, uh, so at the ball, they're exactly pointing in the same direction. So what happened as I cross the ball is that these two vectors, this, these two vectors have, their slopes have crossed. So, and this, this crossing of the slopes corresponds to the order of x and y being changed here from the left to the right hand side. Um, yeah, so what is the continuous Salomon wall crossing formula? Um, well, uh, yeah, I'm not gonna be able to explain <laughs> Tell you what it is exactly, but I'll tell you what what problem it solves at least, uh, what role it plays. Um, let's see. So that that the <coughs> invariant in my title uh, refers to. Not exactly those DT invariants of that uh, Thomas and Thomas thought about originally, where you look at vector bundles over some Kalia threefold. Uh, well, they eventually they might relate to that, but um, right now they relate to kind of more abstractly the kind of DT invariants you have when you uh, look at Kalia three categories. So somehow. Instead of a Kalabiyov free variety, you have a non cumulative Kalabiyov free variety. Um, so T theory, a la Conservative Sutherman. I mean, the original paper came out more than 10 years ago by now, which and Meant to say that it contained a lot of conjectures and some of the proofs were only sketched. And so many, many people have uh, worked on sort of to solve various technical issues and foundational issues um, in this subject. But it's a quote, somehow quite ambitious proposal that whenever you have some three Calabial category, which means that so you have this kind of zero duality like you have on a we have threefold x i between two objects is the dual of x three minus i call that category c y to x maybe dual yeah technically this is a, maybe a infinity category yeah there's some technical stuff that I'm going to sweep under the rug here. Um, uh, plus, you, you, so the idea is you want to count semi-stable objects in some category, so you also need a notion of what's semi-stable, which doesn't come for free, but for example, a Bridgeland stability condition. Uh, which is a so I'm going to call it sigma. So, it's, so these are a pair A Z, where A is the heart of a bounded T structure, so some abelian category that sits in this uh, triangulated uh, category. Uh, so this is a heart. In particular, it's an abelian category that kind of sits in a nice way in this larger category. And also you have what's called a central charge. You have some map from K0 of this category, complex numbers, which set factors through some lattice gamma, which is the same gamma as the one I had over there in my example. Uh, so you can think of this somehow as playing the role of a, of a polarization, right? 
right? So if you want to define stability in algebraic geometry, you need to have some notion of degree. It usually involves some choices. And this is some axiomatic way of thinking about those choices. Mm, and when you have this uh, free Calabial category with stability condition, on this I'll count semi stable objects. with a given class, it's uh, <coughs> lattice gamma, which is a quotient of k0. Uh, where counting is, yeah, so <laughs> counting is a little bit, uh, like it's in this very advanced sense somehow. Or, well, so, I mean, there's the kind of thing that I did here, which gives you some, which works uh, in some examples. What the general case is different in that, uh, so what does this three Calabial buy you? Why did it have to be a three Calabial category? Well, three Calabial uh, means uh, roughly that the, the moduli of objects <coughs> in my category will look like the critical locus of some function. That's somehow very special for, for this three, which, uh, uh, and so critical locus of some function, well, if the function was generic, it would have more singularities, I would have some finite set. Well, the main difficulty is that, well, this is not, it's not the critical locus of, uh, usually of a Morse function. So object of C or somehow critical locus of some function. It's a kind of slogan maybe, not, not like literally true. Um, so you need to play around with uh, Milner fibers but yeah, so there's some technology um, which will produce for you what are called, well, can maybe generalized DT invariants. Omega, gamma, and so for, for generic choice of stability conditions, there are usually integers. Um, in general, it might be rational numbers. <coughs> So this is maybe, so in general, this is modulo some conjectures, and but it, uh, in, in the, at least in the examples I care about, this is definitely, uh, this, you can do this. Um, yeah, so what's the role of this wall crossing formula? Well, it turns out that, so you have to choose the stability condition, but it turns out that if you, if you knew the DT invariance for a particular stability condition, um, then there is a kind of, formally they determine the DT invariance for all other stability conditions as well. Uh, sort of like when you have an analytic function and there's some power series expansion at one point and by analytic continuation, you can get the power series expansion at some other point, right? It's completely determined by, well, maybe depends on choice of path, but. Uh, so this Xavier Solomon wall crossing formula uh, governs the jumps of these omega as uh, the stability condition varies. And so, uh, yeah, how are these omega related to this? So you should imagine somehow that there's a Exponent one, and these exponents are my omega. This is omega of one zero, omega of zero one, for one stability condition, and then these are omegas for another stability condition called to call those omega prime. Zero one is this number. This will be omega prime of one one, and this omega prime of one zero. So th these are the guys that actually count the sand <coughs> connections uh, in my example. But it probably it counts the subtle connections and all their multiple couples, all their multiples. Well, they, they don't, yeah, maybe like imagine you took 
like a, a vector bundle over that saddle connection or something. Like put it, make a brain structure out yeah. of it. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, okay, so what is the what is the general story? Uh, the general relation with quadratic differentials. Um, what is C in that case? In this case. Uh, C is the, that's a good question, C is the Calabi L3, so there's a way if you have a quiver, you can build a Calabi L3 category out of it by taking a kind of double, it's the Calabi L3 category of the A2 quiver. Which you get by, uh, formally, you, like it will have two, described by some kind of graded quiver like this, things in degree one, and then Two to make it Calabi out dual, and then the identities also have to have a Calabi out dual in degree three. So a generator of that category is described by this sort of graded algebra. Um, and then the stability condition means you fix a number in the upper half plane for each vertex. And those two numbers corresponded to those two vectors in the picture. Um. Okay, so somehow what, what happens is that this, this geometry of quadratic differentials uh, embeds into this general setup which I have here. So somehow DT theory is somehow some huge uh, for categories in particular, some huge subject or many different things contained in it, and one of the things contained in it will be these quadratic differentials, somehow, which I find pretty amazing. Uh, so if you take a one of these, uh, so x here is again compact human surface as before. And this will be a holomorphic or meromorphic. differential <clears throat> then there is a construction of, of one of those okay, algebra things so a Calabi L3 category with stability condition which is due to Richard and Smith In the meromorphic case, <coughs> and then which I generalized well, <coughs> variant of variant of in the holomorphic case. So it turns out that in the, in the meromorphic case. The category again, like here, it comes from some quiver, maybe with potential. And in the whole market case, you need to do uh, something different. So the category is not described by a quiver. Um, so I should say what this is, but uh, yes, maybe say what it is conceptually. Um, what is this C here? And this is not what you actually do, but what you should have in mind somehow geometrically. Uh, C will be a higher category. So this might now make you happy or not, depending on whether you're familiar with Fukaya categories or not. Uh, but it's, it's the thing that's on the other side of homological mirror symmetry uh, of some open Calabi threefold. Uh, so, sorry, X, Y. My Riemann surface was x, and now y is a is a non-compact um, Calabi L threefold fiber over x, and the fibers are uh, two-dimensional affine. Well, have to 
the two-dimensional pair, affine quadrics. It's an affine quadric bundle over my original Riemann surface. And it degenerates fiber as a singular quadric over the zeros of my differential phi. So, uh, well, this, this is constructed using the data of both x and phi. Uh, okay, I hope I, yeah, so this is not a Fukaya category crowd. So, um, so actually, so one of the upper problems that I, that I don't know, uh, so by homological mirror symmetry, you should be able to realize this category somehow in terms of coherent sheaves on the mirror. Um, so this category should also appear sort of in algebraic geometry as and its moduli of objects should classify some coherent sheaves uh, on something, uh, which is definitely something that I want to understand, but I, I don't at the moment. We do yeah. So we construct like an embedding into this category, or is it really an equivalent to this category? It's almost like this. So they, yeah, they don't prove it's the, they construct what Ivan Smith in his paper does is construct an embedding, but I think it doesn't matter which, so you could also take the larger Fukaya category. This would, yeah, it's, you're right. That, so there might be some difference, but I think the categories have the same stability conditions and so on, but it's not, it's not an essential difference. Between the two, yeah. So, um, and then your subtle connections are special Lagrangians in this geometry. Yes. Uh, yeah. Thanks. So, I mean, I don't know how much I should say about that because I don't know how much. Uh, yeah. But um, yeah, the idea is that uh, so this comes from some it's Calabi-L three. There's some holomorphic free form called Y. And then it also has symplectic structure, so you can talk about special Lagrangians where this has constant phase. Uh, so Lagrangian submanifolds in Y, where uh, it's omega has constant phase. I guess there's some picture one can draw X. And then this uh, <coughs> quadric bundle, some degenerate fibers. y going to x, and uh, the degenerate fibers lie over the zeros of my quadratic differential, and some saddle connection uh, lifts to a Lagrangian three-sphere inside this uh, open Calabi-L threefold. Yeah, I'm not in this construction. It's maybe yeah calibrated. I'm not sure. Yeah, it doesn't really matter. But yeah, we've just calibrated the ground to some manifold. So there is a difference between monomorphic Yeah, I haven't really told you what to do in, if you have poles here. Um, but um, yeah, basically you can just leave out the poles. Um, it's not exactly what Ivan Smith does in his paper, but uh, some variant. But uh, th 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 maybe we should say that uh, dynamically there's a big difference. So all these interval exchange transformations, they come from this holomorphic case. So uh, if you're interested in these dynamics, then yeah, you, you want to know the holomorphic case, that everything works in that case. The meromorphic case, if I take a straight line uh, on this Riemann surface, I generically just end up at the pole. So I'm not, whereas in the holomorphic case, I take the straight line, I'm winding around the surface uh, densely, generically. Uh, okay, so what's, this, what's the theorem? So you construct this thing. Yeah, and actually there's also a nice, uh, so these, these things here form a moduli space, and also the stability conditions form a moduli space, and they're basically the same moduli space, that's part of the story. Um, but, um, what I want to say, so 
once, once we have the Calabi R3 category of stability condition, you can kind of insert it into this machine, and you will get some DT invariants. Uh, and from the general theory, you know that they, uh, they, they kind of vary, or they jump according to Considerable, considerable solving one wall crossing formula as you vary, well, here you vary in the moduli space of Riemann surface and product differentials. Here you vary in the stability condition, and then <coughs> uh, these, these guys, omega, gamma, will jump, but their jumping is kind of controlled by this formula, which I, I didn't tell exactly what it is, but this was an example. So, what are the, so we, sh I mean, yeah, I somehow said they're going to count saddle connections. So the precise statement is it fits over here, uh, except that uh, you see that. So the theorem is that uh, you know, for generic phi. Somehow so away from the wall, basically. One of the many walls. Uh, you can write down, well, these, these DT invariants actually count saddle connections on my original surface. So omega of gamma will be some n plus, uh, it's called ns of gamma plus uh, n c. Um, yeah, let's let's do the integral version of minus n c of gamma two, where n s is the number of saddle connections. And this here, it turns out you kind of need to, it's better to not just count saddle connections, but also uh, kind of straight lines which close up. And they always come in a cylinder. So this is the number of um, cylinders uh, in this class. class. So on your surface, you look at pictures like this. So this, this loop here is uh, supposed to be a straight line on the Riemann surface. And then it always comes in a one parameter family of such loops. And that one parameter family ends somewhere because you've hit a zero of the quadratic differential. So you count these guys, also some finite number of them, and they, they together tell you the DT invariant uh, of this category. Um, Where here, uh, yeah, this, so my gamma is in this same lattice over here. Okay, so somehow, uh, yeah, what have you gained in the end? Uh, somehow we've moved from dynamical systems to this geometry of correct differentials to categories and stability conditions and then back to numbers. Uh, but it, it does have one important consequence that you can say without um, referring to categories at all, which is that they, they exactly they satisfy this wall crossing formula. And people in work on these product differentials at the moment they don't know how to prove this fact in, unless using general DT theory. So general DT theory tells you this wall crossing formula. Um, yeah, maybe there's some elementary way to prove it, but this is a nice way to sort of see it conceptually um, why that holds. So it tells you that if you have uh, one of these surfaces with quadratic differentials and you were able to count all the saddle connections in all classes, and now you change uh, the point in the moduli space along some given path, then in principle, you can 
program this into a computer, and the computer will tell you what are the saddle connections and their numbers for the other Riemann surface. Okay, uh, I will stop there. Any questions? Well, you want to compute it for at least one, right? And then the considered solvent formula would give it for others. Uh, and the question is, can you, is there like a particularly nice uh, choice of correct differential where it would be easy to compute <coughs> the number of sand connections? Uh, and I think there is. Um, so you recall these stable differentials right, where you have, uh, where this, this foliation you have from the correct differential has only closed leaves, uh, where a generic leaf is closed. Um, and so these things actually look like they should be related to counting of some coherent sheaves on, on some Kali of people. Uh, but that, yeah, that, that's, it's a good question. Um, can you, like, well, yeah. This only tells you if you knew them for one point, what is it for the others, right? Like, what is the best point in order to, to, to get started? That, that, that's a good question, yeah. Could you say a bit more about the construction of the category C for a general surface and like the square number of holes? How do you, what's the outline of the construction of C? Um, <coughs> yeah, so kind of conceptually it's this Fukaya category. Yeah. And uh, well, what I actually do is I look at the Fukaya category of X itself, uh, which is not the same, but then kind of in some formal algebraic way, you can turn it into a Calabial 3 category, and that will be some replacement for this category. So, um, yeah, so the answer is take, take the Fukaya category of that surface X itself and try to turn it into, that's not Calabial 3, it's somehow Calabial 1 in some sense, and try to turn it into a Calabial 3 category. And that's a purely kind of algebraic game to um, you, you arrive at something which should be essentially this, but yeah, which I, is not proven equal to this. But are, are these categories coming from some quiver? So in this meromorphic case, they are. Uh, so there, I mean, there you, you choose some triangulation of the, of the surface whose, whose uh, vertices are at the poles. Uh, so in this this example, um, uh, I choose some triangulation of yeah. I have five points because I so in this example I had a cubic polynomial. I had a pole of order seven at infinity, and that somehow tells me that min seven minus two. I should have a surface with. Uh, Five mark points, and then you make a triangulation on that surface. And then, so what you do in general is you have some triangulation, and you make a vertex of the quiver for every edge, and then you put a little triangle of arrows inside each kind of dual. So your quiver will correspond to the triangulation of the, of the surface. But, but that only works if you have poles, so that. That's what Fritz and Smith did in this meromorphic case. And what I instead do in the holomorphic case is not look at quivers, but I start with the Fukaya category of X and then make it into formally into some Kalabi category. So meromorphic category is no zeros, only poles? Uh, uh, no, no. Uh, so yeah, it should important uh, simple zeros. <coughs> So in all those cases, I should also, my zero should only be simple. Can I ask a question? Um, in the, the language of the Kaya categories of three folds, you, you yeah. always seem to be counting special Lagrangian three spheres. <clears throat> so they're really rigid. And they uh, yeah, well, well, these guys are more like uh, uh, Tori, right? So this ah, is... Okay. This will be an S1 cross S2. 
So then the, the, closed, the closed loop on the original remote service corresponds to an S1 cross S2 in this color. Yes. And so that's, that's why it's not obvious a prior about what they should count as, and you're counting them as minus two. Uh, that was sort of, so, well, their, their moduli space is basically a P1, and what you're seeing is autocharistic P1. Uh, and there, there's, so you can also do something if you have, this is the story if you don't have simple poles. If you have simple poles, then you also count the stuff that goes between the simple poles. And there are some more coefficients in front. Uh, in my paper, you can read the formula for that case, but um, no, we sort of known that this should be the formula. Can you ever get homology spheres, non-trivial homology spheres? Um, I think it, uh, you, not in this construction because they will always come from this matching path construction. Yeah. Maybe you can make some other Calabial people, which also fibers over X, <laughs> where things will correspond to homology spheres. Uh, I just wondered if it could be related to Dominic's invariant counting special Lagrangian homology spheres. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, okay, if there's no more questions, then uh, let's thank everybody.